Guess what? Chicken butt. No. That was a shitty no, one. No, gotta do it again. Welcome to episode one. number 80 something, or perhaps 90. Similar. Of the, the it's like a rental show. car. Toyota Yaris or similar. How about Toyota? Would a Yaris and a Corolla be similar? Or could they sub in a Lancia Delta and a Grale? These questions and more only on this episode of the Carmudgeon Show, part of the Haggerty Podcast Network. My name is Jason Camisa, and that is Derek Tam hyphen Scott and Lancia. The end. Let's go. What's this rapidly Not deteriorating? In a shy way. More. So much more than this. Much more than this. I did it my, my way. way. Paolo, you're not using that. I don't <clears throat> think he's recording. He is. He's learned. God. Right. Maybe, maybe just that last note. <clears throat> <clears throat> well, not. there's a reason why we uh, podcast and not have vocal performances. In Speak music. for yourself. <laughs> Every time I go on a road trip, I swear I'm going to shatter a windshield with a high note. I'm very <clears throat> vocal in the car. I think that with zero deductible, Haggerty will cover that. <laughs> wow, this has turned into an advertisement for car insurance. Uh, I do like having a zero deductible for windshield reasons. Um, some states actually require zero. Like, I think Pennsylvania requires a zero dollar deductible, and it cannot be held against you. You can break in an unlimited amount of windshields, zero deductible, they have to pay them. Hmm. Um, California has separate glass coverage rules, and I don't remember what they are. But the idea in Pennsylvania was that you don't, if the crack is on the side, it doesn't count. But if the crack is in your line of sight or crack or a um, chip, star, chip, they will, they, your insurance company is required to replace that windshield at no cost to you. For safety reasons. Yeah. Hmm. Smart. Meanwhile, in California, nobody gives a shit about safety. We have extremely strict emissions laws and then nothing else. So you can be driving around with bumpers hanging off, cr- totally cracked. So long windshields. as you don't have a check check engine yeah. light on, you're it's, fine. Yeah, it's it's really interesting because California has this, you know, which is so different from the way they do in Europe, like with TUF and, you know, there's an equivalent in virtually every Western European country, I'm sure, where they're like, oh yes, you can't drive on the highway with your bumper misaligned because it might fly off on the autobahn or whatever. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, I mean that's the way that cars should be properly looked after. Most, not most, most. Most of the state, half of the states I've lived in have had an annual uh, like a safety inspection, inspection where they're like, we got to make sure you have tires and lights. It's kind of a good thing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because, you know, like every, every left to our own devices, Americans are just like, Meh. well, like I got in my. Sister's I didn't walk here, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I got in my sister's minivan once. She picked me up from the airport, and she lives in a state with no safety uh, inspection. She had a Honda Odyssey with four point seven billion miles on it, which was amazing because the transmission never went, and they only make it like sixteen miles before the transmission goes. And I hop in the van, the kids are in the back, I say hi, I give her a hug, and she puts it in gear, and the hood goes, Poof. and I'm like, what What the fuck was that? She's like, yeah, it makes this weird clunk. I'm like, put it in reverse for a second. Poof. And I'm like, that's your fucking engine hitting the hood. All four motor mounts were broken. Yes. What was holding in the entire powertrain? The axles and the exhaust. And probably like a battery strap. I'm like, oh, you dumb bitch. And then we start driving. She's going to kill me if she says this. We start driving and it's like, I'm oh, like, wheel bearings. No. And it's, I'm like, is that your brakes? And she was like, you know, they squealed for a while and now they stopped. Mm. Like they, they squeal because, because they put squeal out. compound in it to make you like, oh, something is wrong. I should go get this fixed. But you didn't. And she's like, yeah. And it stops. Duh. I'm like, because now you don't have brake pad at all. No, eventually it'll start squealing because it'll be the backing plates. On no, that was the that was the grinding I heard. It was backing plates. Oh. So the squealing is little pieces of metal that are embedded in the pad that make a <laughs> it's yeah. like sound. Hey, that like the, the sound that I made in that episode, um, and that went away, and then gradually became a, a rumble that you know probably happened so gradually over the four hundred thousand miles that she put on her non brake pads. Um, yeah, so that Christmas I spent in the driveway. I'm doing three of the four motor mounts. I couldn't get to the fourth without uh, any sort of assistance and uh, brake pads and rotors because they were basically just veins. <laughs> yes, <laughs> cooling, cooling veins. Oh, for fuck's sake. Anyway. Um, so yeah, safety inspections. We like those. We like safety. Well, I mean, I want to be able to just, again, Pennsylvania, if you drove less than, I feel like it was 2,000 miles or 5,000 miles, you were exempt from safety inspection. I think it was 2,000 miles. Hmm. Um, if you had classic plates. So just got high class plates on the cars and you could do you just have a look at it it was great i but mean they would find and your bad vehicles are well maintained enough <clears throat> <clears throat> 
ish. Lately, not not at all. I've um, seen your whiteboard. Have you seen? Now I'm going to have to go take a picture of it for an insert. It is not white anymore. It's a it, blackboard. It's a blackboard. It's covered in uh, and blue, dry erase. And orange and everything. Uh, you keep it color coded. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, my cars are in a horrible state of disrepair, which is also a fate that befell your coworker slash boss slash the owner of VCB. Um, oh, did you disrepair his? Uh, oh, he has two deltas, two integrales. So here's the thing. We were going to, we did last week, which almost killed all of us because you ever have like one of these weeks where like so many things go wrong that you just want to go to church and light a candle. Uh, usually what happens is the last thing goes wrong and then I just start laughing because it's yeah. so absurd that things continue to go wrong that there's nothing left to do but laugh because you've already passed the crying and murdering phase. So <laughs> then you are entering the laughing phase. I always picture Chevy Chase in Christmas Vacation when like everything goes wrong and he's like, you know, we're, every, no one's going anywhere. Well, you're in the seventh circle of hell. We're going to have the hap, hap, happiest fucking Christmas since Danny K, whatever, blah, 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 blah. And his God damn it. Fuck. Where's the Tylenol? And it's just, that's what, what everything went wrong last week. But I managed to do an Icons episode on GR Cornholia mm -hmm. together with GR Yaris. And I have not seen anyone put Corolla and Yaris in the same picture. Like they've never been together. Check Australia. They might do it there. Australia has not. Yeah, yes. They're, Australia and I think Mexico might be, I just heard today that Mexico is getting Corolla. Might be the only two places on earth that get both the GR Yaris and the GR Corolla. Um, but I shipped one up from Mexico, friend of a friend, like, fr or I don't, I don't even know some, some car. I mean, we're driving it. And one of the guys is like, so if I get pulled over, I'm like, just be nice to the cop. He's like, well, who owns it? I'm like, I don't Spanish. know. I don't know. I don't know who owns it. I don't know if it's insured. I don't know if it's registered. It's got plates on it. It, we have a key. That's it. I don't know. Well, I mean, we did write a policy on it, you know, for if anything happened to it, but I don't know if there's actual insurance on it, whatever. It all went off without a hitch that part of it so it is wrapped in martini livery mm -hmm. and i just thought that was the coolest thing like if you have a car that's like a little punk like a gr yaris you should wrap it and in it's martini. a homologation car yeah absolutely and there's a great tradition of cars rallying with martini, martini livery. livery so my thought was i would call easy me where you work because easy me slash francesco the owner has a martini five which is a lancia delta integrale evo with One. Evil, Evil one. one, yep. With martini livery, yeah. It's called a martini five. Marti oh, did, did I say Evo five? Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. But it's called martini mm -hmm. five because it was in celebration of their fifth WRC win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which really sucked because then they won another goddamn season. Yes, unbeknown, un un completely by surprise, they they decided the car was done rallying, and so they said, "Okay, we'll make a celebratory martini five edition." And then in '92, they pulled off. It was privateers mostly pulled off a six win and so they're like ah shit so now we have to mark, make a martini six uh so they did that <laughs> only the italian uh we accidentally won the entire manufacturer's title the world Ch rally championship oops uh, for the sixth time in a row which no one has done before Correct. or it since. is the highest it is the most winningest in terms of world rally championships mm. rally car of all time uh, so the martini six also is white with martini livery but instead of being black inside it has this like kind of outrageous uh teal upholstery oh, that's right yeah, uh, and it's an Evo two, so it has a color coded Cat um, catalytic converter, catalytic converter, and color coded rain gutters and sixteen inch wheels. Wow. That's how you tell an Evo one from an Evo two, and you can tell both Evos from the regular ones because they have five lug wheels instead of four lug wheels. Yes, and the front bumpers are different, and the rear bumpers are different, and they and don't have big littles; they have little littles in the headlights. Uh, unless it's a Japan car. <laughs> <laughs> how the Fuck, dude. Uh, yes, I remember this now. You told me this once before. Um, because I did a spotlight episode. This is how this happened. I did a spotlight episode while I was at ACME. Spotlight is the precursor to uh, Revelations. Revelations. And I said something like, well, and the Evo 2's got whatever, blah, 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 little, little headlights. And you're like, not if you're Japanese. Well, now you know. Yep. Again, I knew I forgot and I knew again. But anyway, so Francesco's Martini 5 is currently... Uh, and he's a, indisposed he's a, it's a martini four and a half <laughs> it's missing an engine um so the engine's out of that so that didn't happen so instead he gave me the red delta yes which was described to me years ago as the town whore basically yes everyone's had a ride mm -hmm. i think um francesco's he's had the car for 20 something maybe longer he bought it like in, when he was college age when those cars were free in italy and 
bounced off of the scenery in Italy for a while before bringing the car back here. <laughs> if I remember correctly, half of the people at Isimi have crashed that car. No, really? Yeah, I think Luca, one, you know. Oh, really? He, yeah, apparently, I, I know the car has been in two scenery incidents. <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, I think Francesco's cousin might have also done yes, that. Yes, there was that one. I, I heard a whole bunch of stories. Anyway, this thing is fixed well. Thoroughly pre-owned. Thoroughly pre-owned, but fucking spectacular. Yeah, it is. It is like a, the ideal one to use because it's cosmetically. It's not. It's nice enough cosmetically, really other nice. than the bottom of the, the driver's seat. But other than that, it's it's quite nice cosmetically. It's very on the button mechanically, uh, and it you know you're not going to devalue it if you put a scratch on it or a dent. I mean, it doesn't look. It kind of looks perfect. No, but, now it does. Yeah, but I mean, like repainting yeah. it. You're right. If you had an original paint car, like the, the other, like the, the, the Martini, Martini Five, five yeah. is very low kilometers and. So anything that happens to it is like, oh, that's very painful. But this car is just like. So he gives it. So Francesco is like, yeah, sure, you can have it. And he ships it down to me at Willow Springs so that I can race it against the GR Yaris and GR Corolla. Because I'm sorry, this is the the GR Yaris, I would say, is the most significant race, like WRC homologation hatchback since the Delta. Controversial statement. Back it up. What do we got? Well, I don't know. There's a whole bunch of other stuff from Hyundai, and I don't, I don't pay attention. I don't know anything about rallying after 1992, effectively. Okay, but, see, that's the thing, is you if know. you don't know, if you know, yeah, but, if you hyphen know that the Japanese spec Evo 1 and 2 got the fucking blah, 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 then you should know. If there was something that would more significant, uh, But this is a more know. reflection of my inability to pay attention to modern stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, look, I looked, I looked really quickly. So in the U.S., we only ever got one homologation four by four turbocharged WRC hatchback ever. It's not the Celica no. all track. Mazda 323 GTS. Oh, I found that one. That's right. I told you, you found about that it. one. Because uh, I said uh, Celica all track and then you're like, no, that's not really not a hatch. hatch. And it, I mean, it's got a hatchback. Yes. And then I was like, oh, 323 GTX. Yep. yep. Have you so, driven one? N- no, actually, funny enough is I mentioned it to you and then I mentioned it to my buddy Maurice and he's like, oh, hold on, this one in San Francisco. And so he leaves a note on the car for me. And the guy actually just emailed me this morning. I don't think it's moved in many, many, many years. But I was going to bring it down. I thought, well, we'll ship it down and shoot that too. But um, I think it's um, the cobwebs in the, in the, between the wheels and the brake rotors tell me that it's probably not gone anywhere. Um, mm-hmm. And apparently those cars are very fragile. Like you mm. look at them the wrong way and the transmissions explode. Really? I drove one once around the block and I found it to be very amusing. And that was when they were like free. So I was like, wow, what a, like infinite ROI, very are entertaining. They, are they worth anything now? Maybe they're still not worth anything. I, have no, yeah. I genuinely have no idea. I mean, no one's I, thought anyone has got one, but yeah. they, so they only made 1,200 of them, I think. The US. I don't know. I mean, let's see if that car, uh, oh, for the US, for perhaps. 4,000 yes, total, yes. 1,200 for the US, something like that. But that's the only WRC homologation hatch that I could find. That came, um, to the that US. came to the U.S. Um, and I, you know, there have certainly been plenty of other homologation cars, but the real homologation cars didn't come here. So, for yes. example, STI, um, that motor, that's the U.S. car, the two it's and a half two and liter. Half liter, yeah, not the two liter. That's not the homologation car. It's all based on the homologation car. So, I just kind of thought, well, it's the closest we ever got, at least. I mean, it was right. such an. I remember when that car, when the 04 WRX STI came out, it was such an exciting car because for so long people weird americans had been watching rally cars mm-hmm. subarus uh and you know we never got anything like that then the impreza came and mm-hmm. holy shit we got a four-wheel yeah. drive turbocharged mm-hmm. subaru and then the sti came oh my god it's got 300 horsepower yeah. and does zero to 16 four nine that's as fast as a bmw m5 here's the crazy part it still does <laughs> what? the current the current wrx oh, it's, still it's, just, it's all the same like it's never evolved it's been 25 years anyway but really my my theory was that the Integrale invented the super hatch. Hmm. So, you know, you have a hot hatch and the hot, the idea of a hot hatch is fast commuting, right? It's a practical, economical, For a affordable box. Car. Right. But then a super hatch is something that's developed for WRC and then driven mm. on the road. And Interesting. I just, and so the group B cars don't count because they're too they're insane. wild. Right. These are hatchbacks. The idea, so and even the Renault R5 Turbo didn't count in my fucked up logic because that removed by putting the motor in the back it removed all the usability of it as a hatchback yes it was down to two seats which applies equally to the 205 turbo 16 exactly all of those cars so really i thought all right the the there were certainly other homologation cars but the the delta integrale retained four doors five seats four or five seats whatever it was um all of the usability of a hot hatch but then actually went and won 
six consecutive years manufacturer titles at WRC. That's pretty amazing. Right. And this was all because Group B was shit-canned partway through 86, uh, because mm. people kept crashing them and some people died, uh, and they just, the cars were too fast. And so they rewrote the rules. Like, they, they stopped midway through 86 because of a lethal crash in Corsica, uh, and they replaced it with Group A. And Group A, the homologation requirement, instead of, oh my God, I don't know what the... The Group B requirement was 200 cars, mm -hmm. I think, and Group A was 5,000 cars. And Lancia happened to have a car that was like exactly right for those rules already, which was the it, not the Integrale, it was the Delta 4x4, 4x4 Turbo. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they like made a few changes to it, and then they were like, yeah, we could definitely sell this. It's a replacement of the 4x4 Turbo, which we're already selling. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why Lancia... But they flared it out, right? Yeah, they so flared the wheel arches mm -hmm. was the the primary external difference. I remember doing research on Integrale and the uh, the the one common theme was that every iteration got more power and then they mm -hmm. wound up with, once they went to the 16 valve or the Evo, got rear biased all wheel drive. So they were making in, improvements along the way, but almost everything was actually just to fit larger tires. Yeah. Like everything, the flares kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And by the end, the Evos were six inches wider than a regular Delta, which yeah. is nuts. Yeah. Um, and you can see it. That's one of the other ways to tell the difference between an Evo 1 and a, mm -hmm. an earlier Integrale. Right. Is the... Um, there's the a, there's, a the ton, there's a ton, right? There's a hood scoop and there's all kinds of other stuff, right? The hood bulge was added when they went to 16, 16 valves. valves. Yeah. And that engine dated back to 1672. That was Aurelio, it's an Aurelio Lampredi. Aurelio Lampredi design from the 60s for the Fiat 124. And then it powered every damn car ever. You know, <laughs> I think it was in the 132. Obviously, it was in the 131. It was in the 037 and the Delta S4. Wow, I'm just going to have to do a shitload of inserts. I'm going to stop talking now. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that engine was widely used in a lot of different Fiat and, and Lancia products. Oh, yep. Beta, sorry, couldn't help myself. Uh, but that, so, that that Lampredi motor was Fiat. We used in terms of just brands. It was mm -hmm. used Fiat, Lancia, Alpha never used it, did they? Nope, they had their own. They had their own. Yeah, that's it. So I just think Fiat. So. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Well, it depends on whether you include the Saab branded version of the Delta, the Saab Lancia, or yeah, Lancia Saab six hundred was how the Delta was sold in the Swedish market. GTFO. So it's a Saab six hundred. That's crazy. I didn't know this. But it, on the back of the car, it says Saab hyphen Lancia or Lancia hyphen Saab. That's where you got your name from. <laughs> Undoubtedly. <laughs> your yes. parents were like, I debuted around the same time as the Saab 600. <laughs> Saab hyphen Lancia 600. Um, yes. Okay. But the, the, where were we? <laughs> we were talking about Lancia and Rally. Oh, and, and we were talking, and we were talking about the, the Yaris and how it is significant. So I'm interested to, to hear more about your theory about why it is the most significant. More than like a 22B or. <sighs> Well, 22B is not a hatch. Oh, yes. Okay. So, I mean, okay. Is the, the Yaris is interesting because also that was developed as a homologation car, but wasn't a homologation car. I didn't realize this until I started. Oh, really? Yeah. So, uh, Akio Toyota, T-O-Y-O-D-A, CEO of Toyota, um, has been saying for a decade, I don't want to ruin the whole script for this episode, but he's been saying for a decade that he's not going to stop until people stop referring to Toyotas as boring cars. And that's a quite a big hill to climb. One, <laughs> well, you know, the other way they could do that is maybe not make boring cars like Priuses and. Cr Have you seen the new Prius? It's beautiful. Yeah, and the reason that I had one last week in that shoot was because I wanted to see if it beat the fucking Delta around the track. It's got two hundred something horsepower. It's fucking fast now. So you know, even the Prius, the, the line that I hope makes it into the edit, and I don't know if it will, is like, even the Prius went on summer break and came back with tits. Like, the Prius is hot now. Like, what, what the fuck did that happen? So, <clears throat> Toyota wanted to uh, participate in the WRC. They, they had been campaigning the old Yaris, and this was going to be an all-new uh, uh, all new car for WRC. The WRC team said the four-door was not going to work. So, Yaris is a five-door only, Period. Uh, but structurally, for whatever reason, the five-door couldn't work, so they made a three-door version of the Yaris and then found that they, they needed some aero help. And so even I think the the roof, the base, the, the windshield is the same sort of uh, height as they made the a regular fastback. car. They made a fastback, and it actually tapers by 3.75 inches by the time it gets to the back of the, the top of the, the, top of the window. Right, only so that it can direct airflow to the big spoiler that they needed the WRC car. So, I mean, this is, this is insane. You know, when you talk about a homologation version of a car, right, the body on the original Integrales was not different from the regular cars. It was cut and fender, like over fenders were welded on. To go from a 
five door to a three door, you realize now it has to have frameless windows. So they had to engineer all of that. And you really see when you open the trunk of the Yaris, there's like normally like a, a cargo cover that pivots up. It's just a piece of cloth that's literally pathetically dangling. And you know, they were like, enough. We can't spend another billion dollars on a cargo cover. This is such a waste of money. So they really did do this, made an all new all wheel drive system specifically for WRC, um, turbocharged that three cylinder, which wound up being the most, is the most powerful three cylinder engine ever made. Um, and then made this new body for the car and then COVID hit. And they were, they had to stop testing and they had to delay the car because of parts availability and they weren't allowed to test and all this other shit. And then realized that by the time that car got into production, it would be a one year car because WRC added hybrid systems the following year. Mm. So it was a dead end. So they buy that car never, never did go racing. They huh. killed it. They killed the WRC car, but Akio said, well, fuck it. We did all this work. That. Yeah. Make, I don't <laughs> but in Japanese. Actually, yeah. Maybe. Or maybe he was like, well, you know, we've already spent this money. We don't know how he phrased it, but his sentiment was, fuck it. We'll make, and I think they, he promised like 25,000 units if, up to 25,000 units if uh, would demand, buy yeah, if demand sufficed. And it certainly did. They've extended it by two, production by two more years. Mm. Um, and then of course we couldn't get, we don't have, <clears throat> we don't have a Yaris here in the U.S. Anymore. Any, I don't, anymore. Anymore. Um, and so the best thing to do, <clears throat> the reason that the Yaris has the big fender flares at the back is because it uses the Corolla's rear suspension. Corolla is multi-link and the Yaris is a torsion beam and they wanted the multi-link. So they put that in there and now it's wider and then they, whatever long, there's a great episode coming out on this. Um, but I really think this is a big deal that Toyota went through the huge, huge, huge expense of homologating a street car with a different body, different chassis. I mean, the car is completely different from a regular Yaris. It's and like then, a bespoke uh, rally car almost, mm -hmm. which is I'm on the in the final throes of the the Lancia Stratos episode right now, and it's the first car ever that sort of was cut from that cloth. I mean, maybe even more so. More so because the Stratos was the first car, first rally car ever to be designed first and primarily as a rally car and Correct. then turned into a street car. Correct. And I can think of almost no cars. We've we talked about this actually for the M BMW M1. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of very, very few cars that started out as a race car and then was converted back into a street or converted into a street car. From there. And only because they had to be right. to homologate it to sell it. And it's funny when you read all of this sort of, and, the, and my experience with the car confirms this, that... They didn't give a shit about selling those cars to the public. They just needed to be built. They didn't need to be sold. And so, like, Lancia didn't certify the, the road-going Stratos for sale in, like, the UK, for example, where there's probably a large number of petrol heads who would like to drive rally cars on the street, for example. Uh, I think maybe they didn't even do, like, Germany or something like that. They did, like, Italy and, like, two or three other countries. Uh, that the car was certified for sale in. And so they had unsold cars in 1979, <laughs> even though the production ended in 75. Wow. Yeah, they just, nobody would buy, and they were expensive, yeah. but they just needed to build X number of those cars. What was the, what was the car that they duped the WRC officials on that Clarkson did that unbelievably oh, so hilarious scene? This on? happened with the 037 <laughs> because they were counting a little closer, but this happened even more brazenly with the uh, Stratos. So the Stratos... I guess we can go deep on the Stratos now. Uh, they, the concept came out, well, that's how far back do we go? So Lancia had the Fulvia, front wheel drive, little 1600cc in its, that was the big engine one, originally it was 1100cc, <laughs> uh, rally car. And they were just started, were like, oh, let's start racing these things in rallies. And they were pretty good. And been, but by 1970, uh, they were starting to be less competitive because Porsche and uh, Renault Alpine were making cars that were mid-engine or rear-engined and they have better traction because the engine's over the Trans rear wheels, wheels, which is where the weight transfer is under acceleration. Uh, so the Stratos was uh, conceived as a dedicated rally car because the Fulvia was sort of at the end of its line. And uh, Can I stop you there for one second? <clears throat> at what point did... So we don't, we don't have many Lancia aficionados in the United States. Lancia was a premium brand, correct? I yes. mean, sort of is still to this day when they sell Chrysler minivans, I guess, with a Lancia badge on them. They were a premium badge. At what point did they go, would, did rallying become part of that corporate image, corporate identity? So they were actively involved in motorsport um, in the 
since always maybe certainly in the 50s mm -hmm. and so in the 50s they were doing sports car stuff with the Aurelia and an Aurelia B20 famously got second place it's a two liter car behind a 4.1 liter Ferrari in the uh, Mila Miglia uh, in 1951 that was a factory-backed car. This was a factory-backed car dri mm -hmm. driven by Giovanni Bracco and uh, Claudio Maglioli. I think. You were there, right? So it was, weather yes. was nice that day. Yeah, it was decent. Well, <laughs> no, it rained a lot, actually, and that was why the two-liter car could keep up with a 4.1 oh. uh, from Ferrari. Uh, anyway. Did you have an umbrella, Derek? Did they use uh, rain on the windshield? Anyway, go It on. hadn't been invented yet. Okay. I was busy at performing the invention of rain because in response to the 1951 <laughs> Mila Milia's wet conditions. Uh, uh, anyway, so they, they also developed a bunch of sports cars during this period, dedicated sports cars that were very sophisticated, and they did an F1 car. Uh, and then, of course, this was deeply expensive, and, uh, and then um, Alberto Ascari, their star driver, died in 1955. And so mid-season, they handed everything over to Ferrari, and they stopped racing in 1955. Uh, and then a bunch of... Why Ferrari? Um, Forza Italia? I don't okay. know. Ferrari was also struggling with F1 cars at that time, and so they had Lancia had was effectively the most successful or sophisticated F1 car in the 1955 season. Ferrari's like fucking, I don't know what I'm doing. So they handed it over to Ferrari. Spares cars, engineers, even Vittorio Iano went to Ferrari at that point. He had been at Lancia up until then, uh, and Ferrari sort of finished it off and finished running the car and won the world championship with the car, which was by now at this point a Ferrari instead. It was the Ferrari Lancia D50. Uh, and Lancia leaves motorsport because they're like going out of business. The Lancia family in 1955, the same year, sold the company effectively. They sold the majority shares of the company to a cement magnate named Carlo Pizzanti. And uh, so they're busy trying to stop hemorrhaging money on the cars and trucks because Lancia also made trucks. Uh, and so racing at that point by 1960s was like privateers. And it, in 1963... What's his bucket? Uh, ah, Fiorio. Cesare Fiorio started um, their a race team, and then Lancia bought it in 1965, and then they started really rallying in the early 60s. So that was the answer to your question. Uh, early mid mid sixties. So mid sixties that now becomes part of Lancia's identity again. Yes. It's not just racing motorsport. It's, it's rallies. It's specifically. rallies. But they did circuit stuff too. They won like their class at the Daytona 24 Hours in a one point three liter car or something like that uh and they would they um i think targa florio they did pretty well also in their mm -hmm. class uh, so at the same time uh bertone was like we would like the business of lancia to build road cars because right now they are using pininfrina uh, and so they developed this thing called a Stra stratos zero which looks like a doorstop and there's a glass lid on the front of it that folds up and you get in by stepping into the car um and that caught Lancia's attention because they were like we need a rear engine rear wheel drive car that's specifically for rallying and so they were like can we see this thing up close uh and so Nuccio Bertone drove the car across Turin like in traffic in a doorstop and, and under the gate yeah. at the Lancia factory so because the gate was because the car's lower than the gate yeah I uh, love that story. And Lancia was like, okay, I think we can work with this. Um, like, and they wrote him a contract. And then, so, th so that, that was the origin of the Stratos. But they never knew what was going to power the car. And so the Stratos Zero appeared in Turin in 70. And then a year later, they had the concept of what became the rally car at the same show. So literally a year later. So they developed the whole car in nine months. The Zero was, was a X19 underneath? No, it was a, I think it was a bespoke chassis, but it had a Fulvia powertrain, but in the back. So they just moved the whole thing because it was a front engine, front wheel drive mm -hmm. car. They just put it in the back of the car hmm. uh, and they wanted to catch Lancia's attention, which they did. Uh, and so it was Bertoni who built the Stratos chassis and bodies of all the production cars. Uh, and so they didn't know it was going to be in the engine, the engine wise in those cars. Uh, they Lancia didn't have an engine that was bigger than 1.6 liters at the time that would have worked. Or a period, I guess. Um, let me fact check that. I think that's true. And He's so the, the only person, ladies and gentlemen, who facts checks himself. <laughs> Normally, most people go to Google or get a book out. You're well, like, I don't have on. any Google on me right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the they wanted to use the Ferrari engine, the Ferrari V6, mm -hmm. but um, and Enzo for, they went and asked Enzo Ferrari, and Enzo Ferrari said, Sure. Why not? Um, Remember, they're friends, right? I mean, yeah. And they had 
you know, the Ferrari V6 actually does owe quite a bit to Lancia's V6 because I remember how I mentioned Vittorio Iano left Lancia to go to Ferrari. He, when he arrived there, they had him design a V6 uh, uh, that was the earliest of the Dino V6s. I thought that the the reason that it was referred to as the Dino V6 and the car was called the Dino is because Alfredino, yes, yes, Enzo's but he, son the, per, the engineer, the no, 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 Vittorio Iano designed the engine. I mean, he did, he worked at Alfa Romeo. He was an engine right, designer. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so he designed the first one, and then eventually someone else, I forget who, I think his name was Rocky, actually, uh, R-O-C-C-H-I, did the later Dino engines. But so that, that V6 engine had some Lancia Dino. heritage mm -hmm. from, and the V6 was invented by Lancia in the late 40s. And so, where are we? What's what's interesting? What are we? Where are we, where are we trying to learn? Right, engine, Stratos well, yeah, engine. So Stratos engine was they got it eventually. It took them like two years to get Ferrari to finally agree. And Enzo was fine with it, but he was only doing racing at that point. And Fiat had bought Ferrari or sort of was in charge of Ferrari's road, road cars mm -hmm. operation. And the Fiat men that were running Ferrari's road car operation were really intransigent about guaranteeing. 500 engines which is what they initially needed to homologate the stratos as a road car and so initially with the stratos raced as a prototype because it hadn't been homologated because they didn't have enough engines from ferrari and there were other development issues uh to run the stratos as a um as a group four car mm -hmm. so it ran in prototype as a group five instead uh dedicated rally car anyway is is mm -hmm. the takeaway from that uh, what else? But that is the one that they sort of lied about development on. Right? Yes, right. That's what I was. That's what the story I was supposed to be telling. In my old age, I'm forgetting all this. So uh, yes, it took them so long to build the cars, and then there were strikes in 1974. So that they did, Ferrari signed a contract or verbally agreed to provide the engines in December of 72, got them a contract in March of 73. And then the general manager of Lancia wasn't confident enough that Ferrari, despite the contract, would actually provide the engines until the end of 73. Uh, and so they didn't tell Bertoni to start building cars until the end of 73. Uh, and then there were strikes in 74. And so like one car was built in February of 74. And then there was like a different colored car, presumably a different car at Geneva in March of 74. And then there were strikes in April of 74. And they've been trying to like homologate the car in order to go racing for years at this point because the car is a prototype. Maybe it's competition debut in uh, October of 72, I think. A long time. So two years before, because the car was finally homologated October 1st, 1974, but not because they had built the required number of cars. <laughs> um, out of desperation, Cesare Fiorio just wrote a letter to the governing body and was like we're done and they sent we did it yay they sent paul frere over and paul like looked around and was like i don't know he was an fa inspector mm -hmm. and he looked around he's like i see some cars here and they granted him papers mm -hmm. on it and they had built like less than half of the required number of cars mm -hmm. but like was they it, didn't even bother to count was the story true that they they showed them so that's the 037, oh, the 037. Story. Okay. with the stratos they didn't even bother to do that they're just like here's some cars and they were like, here's some papers so you can go racing. And so the papers were granted October 1st. October 2nd they, uh, was the fourth round of the WRC mm -hmm. uh, and in Italy, in San Remo. And so literally the next day after the papers were granted, they were racing and mm -hmm. won. Uh, and then despite the fact that they hadn't had the car for the... I mean, the racing season starts in January and this is now October 1st. Mm -hmm. And so after that win, they were in second place in the world championship because uh, a bunch of rallies were canceled in 74. Fuel crisis, and then oh it, Monte Carlo was canceled mm -hmm. in 74 because uh, there were political, th there was a rule change and nobody liked it. And so there was this huge controversy and they were just like, ah, fuck it, we'll cancel it. So the combination of that canceled a bunch of rallies. And so even though it's October and they there's they've now... Participated one, in one they, race, two, because they ran Kenya in, with a with a leftover Fulvia mm -hmm. that was uh, the East African Safari uh, in May, I think, of seventy four. So they had run two events. I think they got third in the East African, and then they won at uh, San at San Remo. And then they're like, "Oh shit, we have a chance. We're second behind mm -hmm. Fiat." So they air freighted a car over to North America because there were two rounds in North America: one in Canada and one in the Press On Regardless Rally in Michigan. It was a WRC event in Michigan. What? Yes. 
So they air freighted cars over and like did well enough in those. And then they won the last event of the year, which was the Tour de Course. And they won the 74 uh, championship. <laughs> so uh, having started in October. Having started in racing so in October. Nice. Um, and that was how the Stratos made its, its competition debut. Uh, but yeah, homologation that they finished building cars after they won the World Rally Championship. Hey, they did the it just, yeah. They, yeah, they did. And then they, were, they, could, they weren't selling them because until for, for another four years, yes. I think you'd still buy leftover new uh, Stratos. So then cars. because I mentioned it, we should probably go back to it. Then, then the 037 was the car that replaced Stratos later on. Within Lancia, yeah. So, so the other thing that happened is throughout this period, F Lancia beat Fiat, which, who was number two, and Fiat owned Lancia at yeah. the time. And they were running separate rally programs. And at some point, Fiat's like, okay, enough of this usurpation from the from the underlings like fiat should be winning rallies and so they shit can they pulled the plug on the stratos prematurely mm -hmm. before it was really finished even being developed i think before maybe it reached its peak and so even though it won three world championships the car probably could and should have, have won more but fiat pulled the plug on it and said we're going to put all this effort into our car the fiat 131 mm -hmm. so the 131 did win i think two world championships uh, and then the teams were la were merged into Fiat Lancia, and then Fiat stopped. Basically, they they put all their rally public effort, even though it was now is all one entity, into the zero three seven. After that, uh, and so that is the one where they built the cars. half the requisite number of cars. And they moved them while they were at a long were, drunken yeah, lunch. Yes, took the took the uh, race officials to a long drunken lunch, moved the cars from one parking lot to another, and then showed them the. <clears throat> other half yes and if any of you haven't seen it you should see clarkson did a really, really i think it might be the best thing he's ever done yeah uh very funny sort of recreation of that like historically accurate i think i think i don't think he got anything wrong it's been a while but um uh recreation of that in a very very comedic way mm -hmm. um so yeah clearly that launcher team was really the launcher guys because they were still full of shit as they had been with the stratos well it yeah, the context is important here. I mean, Lancia was constantly going out of business, basically, starting in the 50s. Uh, and then the Fiat takeover occurred in 69. And so the, that's, that's the context in which the Stratos is being developed, right? They subbed the car out to Bertone in large part, Marcello Gandini and Gianpaolo Dallara. Mm -hmm. Well, Gianpaolo Dallara was a consultant for Lancia. And he designed the Mira chassis. Uh, and then they had him do a bunch of work on the uh, Stratos chassis. And the same designer of the bodywork, Gandini right. uh, between the Mira and the, the Stratos. So a lot of parallel similarities between those cars. But they subbed that work out because they didn't have the budget to do it in-house right. because they had just been bought by Fiat and they were losing money and there was a fuel crisis and there were, you know, strikes. I mean, it's genuinely shocking that that car made it to production because there were so many hurdles. battles right. and, and hurdles. Yeah, And it was by the sheer willpower of Fiorio and then also the one of the Fiat men that had been installed at Lancia to do the to be the GM he was basically the Fiat guy who they put in to run the Lancia he was super into the idea and so mm -hmm. because they had buy-in from a Fiat guy um, Pierre Hugo Gobato uh, was name. the guy anyway those two men mm -hmm. are really substantially responsible for the fact that the Stratos made it through in spite of all of the mm -hmm tough shit that was happening at that time but yeah so they were always like kind of under resourced and sort of scrappy and like eh, we'll just sort of make it work try and figure it out and i think that everyone was worried about the success of motorsport and so they were like yeah we're willing to look the other way a little bit in order to grant this car homologation papers because it's such an exciting car that deserves to race mm -hmm. and you know it's kind of a dark depressing time for motorsport i mean they literally the they canceled a third of the schedule of rallies of world rally championship events in 74 because it's of the fuel cool. crisis and so i think everybody was like everybody collectively needs a pick me up right. so we want to see this car so, race and so look the other you way, know, right. i see a number of cars here and it appears that you could actually make and and so the the rules were changed from 500 to 400 cars uh homologation and ultimately i think generally the consensus is that between 490 and 500 stratoses were made mm -hmm. So they did. Uh, it. So they did eventually right. homologate the car properly. They just didn't do it the, the way before it was, was to be, right? <laughs> before the car started racing. Right. Which is why, for example, M1 was such a hard sell. Right, that was a race car that wasn't allowed to go racing because they didn't sell. They weren't allowed to go racing until the 400. I think it was 400. Yeah. Also, be, if they were, they were going right. to run it in Group Four. four. 
Yeah, four yeah, and five. So. But yeah, they needed to. They needed the four hundred for Group Four, and that was going to take two years. And they did not. They couldn't race the car until that moment. Yeah, happened. because then by that point, the rule changed for um, Group B it was right around the corner. Uh, yeah, but this is the difference between Germans and Italians. Germans are like, well, if we wait till we have done four hundred and one cars, and the Italians are like, good enough, good enough. Um, so, how many zero three sevens were made? I don't know. How do, oh, you just came off of. Uh, how do, what do you mean you don't know? That's something you're not. Let's capable see. Of. If it had to run in Group B, they had to make two hundred. I think so. It, the number is greater than two hundred. Okay. Um, <laughs> so that, well, I'm just trying to move Lancia Rally forward, right? So we have the first thing that happens. So, uh, so as you said, Stratos dies prematurely, mm -hmm. replaced so by that Fiat, Fiat one thirty one can run right. That winds up being replaced by zero three seven, which is the last rear wheel drive car to ever win the world rally championship yep race in 83, 83 monte carlo they won the championship well they, the they won other events in 83 but they won the championship in in 83 in, against audi quattros right. which is remarkable but you know this is covered in clarkson's piece that was an unusually unsnowy monte carlo mm -hmm. which is in the like alps effectively not quite it's a little bit too far to the uh west uh, but it's January in the mountains, right? It should be a snowy event, but it was an unusually unsnowy event. And so the 037 with Valtteri managed a w victory at that event. And they kind of just, by the skin of their teeth, I think they won by one point, if I remember correctly, in 83. Right. I mean, it was really, really close. And that then shortly thereafter was the end of that well, series, right? Then they made a four-wheel drive version of the car. As an S4. Yes. Right. That's the four-wheel drive with a supercharger and a turbocharger on Correct. it because what could possibly go right? Um, <clears throat> and then how did they wind up with needing to homologate Delta? So that was because of the end because of Group the B. Change. Okay, so yeah. Group B ends from all the accidents. Yeah, they said, we need, we're need. we going to go to less powerful cars and the homologation requirement is not 200 cars anymore. It's 5,000 cars. And so it has to be a car that you can genuinely sell 5,000 copies of. The reason why Group B was so unhinged is because they only had to make 200 of them. And so you know, if you wanted to go racing, you'd be like, well, throw away 200 cars. We'll sell them for whatever they cost. You right. know, a, a, I looked this up. A Peugeot 205 T16 cost the same as a 911 when it was new. So, oh. you know, expensive yeah. car. Yeah. But if you only have but to sell 200, only 200 of, them, of them and it's Peugeot and they want to go racing and the prestige, the value, marketing value of racing and winning events in a Peugeot because the, the T16 is probably one of the best Group B cars to ever race in terms of its capability. Mm -hmm. uh, the S4 also. The S4 really was pretty stonking as well, but it was just coming into its own when the, when the series was canceled. Um, so yes, they went to a lot less spicy cars for WRC in response to the dangers of Group B, and that's yeah. why the Integrale happened. Right, because and Delta actually, the but it was just hit after hit after hit right. for Lancia for right. like decades. I mean, Audis did well during this period too, but Lancia was right at the front right. for a twenty-year period. Uh, rather amazingly, uh, to me, that the the Delta benefited so much as a, the Integrale as a race car benefited so much as, as, as Lancia being a luxury premium car manufacturer. And this is something I didn't realize until I was doing research on that car for the spotlight. But for example, that car had four wheel discs and four wheel independent suspension, which is something that little shit box family hatchbacks it didn't have um, designed by Jajaro, but it was mm -hmm. a, a does, half the a Ritmo probably does too. By European standards, the, the right. Ritmo was the Fiat version of the Delta, uh, but the Delta was trimmed nicer. Right. Uh, and this is all part of the Fiat empire at this point, and so they're trying to stratify. They're trying to put space between those cars because mm -hmm. initially, before Fiat acquired Lancia, they were sort of supposed to be competing against each other, but mm -hmm. the Lanchas were more expensive because they were better engineered and better made and drove better, but they were ha had the same performance. And so... You know, that was always the tough sell with la like Lanchas was like, oh, it's so expensive. But then if you're like a mechanical connoisseur and you're like, yeah, but it feels so good. And the road holding is so much better than a Fiat, which also has 1100 cc's and 50 horsepower or whatever. Right. You know, the, the idea of behind Lancia in the 50s before the Fiat acquisition was that they should make economy cars or small, it, it, not thirsty cars mm -hmm. that weren't shitty. Right, uh, and they, you know, sold I think almost a hundred thousand Appias, for example, which was their smallest car in that 
era. So there were people who were like, yes, I would like a an economical small car, but that's well made and luxurious, well engineered, and has good road holding and feels nice to interact with. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of like a little space. Ma- well, I guess the golf kind of does that now golf and cars did. are good enough now that mini mini did it i mean it was highly stylized but the idea behind mini is that it's a modern mini pr- right modern yeah. mini yeah R50 premium R50. small car yeah um and there are very very few of those you're not gonna see lexus ct 200 h's all over the road i mean that was you know a premium small car yeah. didn't really happen but integrale really benefited from that philosophy of let's make a premium car and it wound up having some pretty sophisticated shit in it Mm-hmm. Um, consistent with the mm-hmm. Lancia philosophy right. of technical innovation. Although, you know, that 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 was not a particularly bright era for Lancia. The, the the Integrale was definitely a bright spot, but they really got Fiated. Mm-hmm. Uh, and by that, I mean that after the acquisition by Fiat in 1969, there was a lot of... I mean, fortunately, they got the Fiat engine, which was actually a genuinely good component from Fiat, but... The that era of Lancia's was doesn't have the same magic of the earlier, earlier cars stuff. because Fiat was like you can't make cars like this and sell them to the public. The reason why you keep going out of business is so because you too make nice. right. cars that are too nice, but that don't offer. People are willing to pay more for more performance, but they are not as likely to pay more for higher quality. At least not enough to sustain you know a yep. company the size of Lancia. Right. And you drive that Delta and you see the Fiat interior. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, the plastics and stuff and the way that the whole dashboard shakes. And uh, I mean, it's pretty appalling. And that that you you enjoy and like the car in spite of those characteristics. Because, Whereas if you right. go to a pre-Fiat Lancia, you're like, man, this is, and I, I say this often, but it is far and away much better than any other Italian car of that era f- Ferrari and Lamborghini included, especially Lamborghini and definitely Ferrari, definitely Alfa Romeo. It is the highest quality Italian car you could buy before 1970. And that is fair to say Italian Rolls Royces. Yeah. Or Mercedes, depending on your perspective, because Rolls Royce is not very innovative technically. True. Mercedes is. And Lancia, Mm -hmm. you know, always was. I mean, they did, they did the world's first V6. They did V4s, you know, unitized construction. uh, Yeah. V6 was common cylinder heads. Mm -hmm. The, yeah, on the V4s. Mm-hmm. The first V... <laughs> I was reading recently the thing about the v- first V6, which was designed by uh, Francesco de Virg- Virgilio. And he... Uh, the first car they were going to put it in didn't have space for 60... He, he So nobody had done a V6 at this point. And so he did a bunch of math. And he's like, if we change the crankshaft design, it seems like 60 degrees could be pretty balanced which is something every person who knows anything about engines now knows. Yeah, 60 mm-hmm. degrees is the way to do a V6 or 120. 120. But 60 uh, yeah. is better than 90, yeah. yeah. Definitely. And so, you know, he was like, we want 60 degrees, but the car that it's going in doesn't have space for it, so we're going to do a 45 degree and a 50 degree. And he kept experimenting with all these things. And you're like, oh, these are all pretty serviceable. Uh, and then nobody, It was this was for the original Aurelia. And then... Everyone looked at the Aurelia and was like, oh, this thing's kind of ugly. We should redesign it. And he's like, perfect. When you're redesigning it, please make space for a 60-degree engine. And they did. <laughs> and so the first production V6 car, uh, the Aurelia, had a 60-degree V6, <laughs> you know, which is exactly the way that it should be. Uh, and that's where V6s originated. Was with that. Cool stuff. <clears throat> uh, and, yes. And anyway. so now I get onto a racetrack in a Delta Integrale. And this red Delta I've driven quite a lot. And never on a racetrack, so therefore not at the limit. Mm-hmm. Holy shit! Have you driven? Have you driven a lot of deltas? I've driven a number of deltas, and I've driven this car, but not on a racetrack. I have, you know, been over Highway eighty four in it, for example. So out of the box, the sort of stock deltas that you drive, they're a bit, they're a bit laggy. They're definitely quick. quick. I mean, yeah, and they, they're competent and a good way to cover ground over the road. Yeah, but they're Swiftly. not. They very much remind me of an, a WRX. Hmm. Laggy, it's very quick when they're on the boil, but so laggy that a uh, naturally aspirated anything would outrun it in the real world. I mean, you know, I pissed off Francesco when I drove the Martini. I said, look, my Scirocco and my Cabriolet would leave it for dead. By the time this thing turbo spools up, I'm gone, right? It's way faster, but you're just constantly waiting. The, the, 
the interior is just as shitty as the Volkswagens. If not shittier, it's probably shittier. But but the real, the, the amazingness of it is the competency of the car. Mm-hmm. Bumps, don't care. It just mm-hmm. doesn't care Road about anything. Holding. It just goes. Yeah. Floats over everything in the same way that WRX does. Kind of absorbs anything. Bumps don't upset it. Never steps out sideways. A resolute understeerer. Um, and so I expected, and, and then I drove the Red Delta, which is, which is modified. So it's got suspension on it. I think it's got the Group B downpipe and turbo and some programming and whatever all wheel drive front wheel drive based all wheel drive cars are terrible on racetracks with almost no uh, exceptions this delta didn't was, you have an audi exception yeah our uh, current rs3 which is also golf r same new all, all wheel drive system so i had a golf r at this uh, and in this filming, um, cover that at a, at a future point. We had a, a lot of different cars, but that Delta turns like no front engine hatchback I've ever explained. Def- understeer. I mean, you can get it into a four wheel drift if you're violent with it, but mm-hmm. just the the speed of that thing. Yeah, I, it has uh, a great deal of grip. Yep, grip and just competence. Great steering, great brakes, great shifter. Like w- that was a genuine. Putting Randy Popes in it to set a lap time on that was a... Uh, yes, was what was Randy's thing. reaction to that car? Thank you. Uh, well, how did he phrase it? It was like, thank you for making a dream come true to allow me to drive a car like that uh, hard. Like it was, that was his thing. He he was like, just a little more rear bar and it'll be perfect. And meanwhile, he doesn't know that Francesco was putting camera plates on it and didn't get to. But that would have been... I was I brought that car for for historical reasons, but also because I genuinely wanted to know: Can a GR Corolla keep up with a, a Delta? Hmm. And I'm not telling you what the answer is. I also wanted to know when it was. I mean, supposed that's to an be. unrepresentative Delta. In stock form, the Delta is. That's why it was supposed to be the Martini Five, which was <laughs> stock. And then my question was: Can that keep up with a Prius? Mm-hmm. that was what so when you watch the episode don't judge me hard there's a lot of shit that we missed because there was a lot of fuckery going on in the background cars broke not the delta that was the crazy part but we had yes, one car. all the modern cars that you had with things breaking and i mean the cars themselves the tires so, right there was just a bunch of one car arrived broken through no fault of the car it was the previous loan the people had beat it up but i wound up i had, look i had a base yaris so it's we didn't know what the spec of the yaris was it just arrived it was arrived on a on a on a truck and everywhere else in the world from what i can see a yaris with red brakes indicates that it has a limited slip differentials which means that it comes on michelin pilot sport force this car had red brakes but it was on the base dunlop sp sport max whatever the fuck they were um <clears throat> and so i couldn't figure out i'm like did the did the owner put the wrong tires on it like the the less aggressive tires on it um, could be a showroom swap we don't know dealer swap. And, and the reality is it's mexican spec and i can't find anything so mexico this year 2023 model year in mexico only has a circuit edition which comes standard with a limited slip diff and red brakes and michelins so i don't know what it was the car arrives it became clear very quickly that it didn't have it it doesn't have limited slips and you notice the first time you turn into turn two and floor it, it incinerates the inside front tire which neither of the corollas that i had there would have done one of them arrived with a fried clutch from the previous loan, so we couldn't use that. Uh, but my question was, can Delta... So I, I had base Yaris, and then I had... I was trying for a base Corolla. It didn't work because it was broken. Uh, base Corolla with limited slip, and then Marizo. Um, and so the questions were, can this stock Delta keep up with the, old, uh, with the Prius, or can this modified Delta that I had to replace it with because the stock Delta didn't show up, um, or didn't have an engine in it, can that keep up with the new cars? And it's a fascinating, fascinating um, result. Interesting. Yeah. But, I, but you know, people are going to get mad. Like, this, it's a modified... I didn't even say that it was modified because there's no point. I, nothing's stock anymore. You know, once you have a Go Turbo, nothing stays stock for five minutes. It's obvious when you look at the car, it's a little bit lower than it should be. Um, so anyone will know. But I also didn't have... So I wound up racing a base Yaris against a GR Corolla Marizo, which is a crazy package on that car you know we talk about sport packages on cars and you know the car companies will change spring rates and dampers and and you know we'll put sticky tires on it but the marizo goes way further than that different final drive ratios front and rear uh, for both uh final final drives because that transmission has two but also different internal gearing plus 200 and something different structural welds i mean the car really? is structurally different than a regular <laughs> car so it really was apples and oranges 
because the other Apple showed up broken. So it was supposed to be Apple, Apple, and then everything got fucked up. But um, it what was, were your impressions of the uh, Yaris? It, I like, first of all, it looks so dorky dumb. I love it. It's hard to tell with that amazing martini livery on it, but it's actually quite a bit taller than Corolla is, which is fascinating. Mm. A lot narrower and a lot taller. And so it looks dork machine. This one has, we, we don't know what it's got in it. I know it's got a, a Remus exhaust on it and it's fucking obnoxiously loud in all the right ways. Three I, cylinders. I love great. three cylinder yeah, noises. They make really fun noises. So. So it, it's a little bit modified. It's got a it's got a box in it that changes throttle mapping, but you can put it in stock mode. So I left it in stock mode. I think it's it runs the same peak boost that the stock one does, but it felt a little bit stronger than I expected it to. I don't know. I don't even know who the owner is. This was a friend of a friend. The car just shows up. It's amazing. Um, all in all, Yaris is fun. Rear visibility is absolutely shit. I can see why all the UK reviewers are like, you know, you're sitting on top of the car. You're not. The problem is the roof tapers down. And so you're kind of like, well, I can't see anything behind me. And it's a little bit claustrophobic in here. Um, interior is nowhere near as nice as Corolla. Corolla's interior is pretty okay. Um, but the driving position on Corolla is better. The steering column is m way more raked on Yaris, probably because it's dashed to axle so much shorter. So the steering wheel is kind of a little bit higher and more angled away from you. Uh, like an E30. Like an E30. The Corolla steering is better. The Corolla shifter is longer throw, but more positive engagement. Um, brakes feel the same. Clutch feel, felt the same between the cars. Engine feels largely the same. You notice the weight difference. There was 330. I weighed them all the cars because no one, I haven't seen anyone weigh a Yaris and a Corolla. 333 pounds difference between the Marizo and the, um, and the Yaris. And you don't notice it except for when you're off boost <laughs> like the yaris will start to move and the corolla is like eh, and then takes yeah. off um overall i like the corolla better um mm -hmm. but the yaris was fun um and you were exclusively on track or did you have any back roads time? no not too much back roads i mean driving around town the problem was all the back roads were closed because it snowed i mean this i'm telling this shoot everything went wrong but it was snowing and the Marizos on cup twos and I mean, just <laughs> fuckery. Like there was just, I did a 85 mile an hour, third gear, four wheel burnout for a quarter mile um, in going the snow. in the snow in the Marizo, maybe going one mile an hour. Just <laughs> at the limiter in third. The speedometer. Speedometer 83. <laughs> it just stayed at 83 and I got down our driveway but the cars we turned in off this main road and we had to move like we had to get off the main road and stuck you mean <laughs> stuck at four wheels i have a little video of the of the uh, yaris um extracting itself anthony i'm like just stay on it uh, i think that was third or fourth gear you know three four thousand rpm just letting all four spin um it was interesting though because yaris had a very different equipment level than corolla like just it's a f strange thing for us that we don't get cars like Lancias in the United States that are small but well-equipped and mm -hmm. well-built. So this Yaris has a head-up display. It's got old-looking analog gauges, quite nice, but they're quite old, um, with a head-up display, dual-zone climate control, where the Corolla has single-zone, uh -huh. automatic high beams, which the Corolla didn't have, automatic, uh, oh, it just a whole, what the, there was some other weird thing that it had, but the Corolla had single-zone instead of dual-zone air conditioning, but it had auto wipers and the and Yaris didn't. <laughs> And I'm like, what? What is going on here? So it was just a. Well, really it's what happens when you put products from different markets together, and they don't yeah. have this sort of like preserved hierarchy yeah. that is supposed to. Yeah. To it's sort weird. of like, can you imagine an, a heads-up display in a Yaris? Like that's just something that wouldn't that happen. Car in doesn't feel or resemble a Yaris to me. What the GR? Yeah. Really? I mean, it's not. I mean, it's just not Yarisy. Like the, you're not uh, approaching it with the mindset of a Yaris. The mindset of approaching a Yaris is like it's an economy shitbox, and that's not. The experience, you know, I'm approaching, when I walk up to a GR Yaris, I'm walking up to a homologation car yeah. in my eyes. I'm not Fair walking enough. up to an economy shitbox. Interesting. Yeah, I was walking up to a shitbox. I'm like, at the end of the day, look, I love shitboxes. That's don't take that as offense to anyone. But, you know, I love a good shitbox. And that was a fun little car. So I would buy, I'd buy Corolla non-Marizo, but then I'd swap all the Marizo uh, running gear onto it. And then, but I want a backseat. Like, what's the point of a foot? Only this is the only car that I can think of ever, other than cargo vans. That's a four door car with two seats. 
sorry, even worse, a five-door car with two seats. It's got a double luggage compartment. Uh, um, that was a fun episode to do. That launch of blew my mind. I could not believe how good it was on track. It is still stunningly beautiful. Still stands the test of time. I don't want anything all-wheel drive, and I don't like anything with a turbo on it, but man, was that good. And Lancia now is just... Didn't someone at some point in the Q&A ask us, if you had Lancia as a brand now, what you would you do to... We both said we'd kill it. <laughs> <laughs> we'd take it out back and shoot it. <laughs> you don't even have to. Just take it no, out back. No, but I mean, it would be fun to imagine what the ideal products for that company would be. I just, you know, they have such a cool heritage of really compelling cars. I think we'd have to go back to pre-Fiat Lancia, and then it would just be, you know, think of something Mark Seven Golf sized with sixteen wipers on the inside of the windows instead of defrosters, because you're always pointing out these weird wipers that Lancias have. Just great engineering, incredible build quality, but little and simple, mm -hmm. you know, and high and style. Not that interesting from a performance standpoint, but it's a it's yeah. more of a experience mm -hmm. that's pleasurable than. But the it would have like it would have a W seven engine. In it. Yes, <laughs> it's a weird layout with a battery that that, that I, doesn't actually power an electric motor the battery would power a solar panel that would send power to the sun the wind turbine <laughs> yes of course <laughs> obviously obviously because that's the launch away cool uh cool brand wish wish we had more experience with launch here in, in america it is the ideal um product for you know depending on what era you're interested in once you've done all the mainstream normal stuff, then you go experience Lancia afterwards. If you just got in and experienced it for the first time as your first old car, you, you I don't think it would make much of a dent. But if you spend a bunch of time in Fiats or Porsches or whatever, and then get in a Lancia, you're like, whoa, this, this is, is different. outrageous. Yeah. So that's the recommendation. Why like don't, Citroën. Why I, don't you own a Lancia? I should. I, I have owned an Integrale, as you will recall, but I would like a pre-Fiat Lancia at some point. I will definitely own one. You better hurry up Several. because you're saying nice things about them. They're just I know, I know. I, I, I would like a Stratos. I would for sure want a Fulvia, oh, yeah. uh, Flaminia, Aurelia. Those are the ones for me. I think that's their entire lineup, right? Yes, actually, I would take any pre-Fiat Lancia. Okay, that, has been, that is the conclusion. Thank you for listening about Lanchas if you've made it this far, but I won't blame you if you haven't because it's wildly esoteric. And cool. Those are the same thing to me. Fair enough. Thank you for joining in. This has been episode number of the Car... <laughs> we don't know what episode number it is. Of the Carmudgeon Show, which is part of the Haggerty Podcast Network. Until next time. Which will be next week? Probably. Unless it's a holiday or we forget to do an episode.